Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. Saving the seas. This week, the deep sea diver who stopped riding the ocean's obituary to find a solution. And Rick Sala tells us why the next 10 years matter most. And globalization needs to get greener. Shipping accounts for nearly an eighth of all transport emissions. How can the industry clean up its act? Plus, protecting coastlines comes at a huge environmental cost. But one Israeli startup found a way to keep the sea out and the animals in. From London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. After more than a decade of studying the ocean as an academic, Enric Sala realized he was writing the ocean's obituary. He quit his job and became a full-time conservationist. As an in-house explorer for National Geographic, he's clocked more than 5,000 open water dives. He's also founded Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to lobby countries to protect their oceans. To date, it has helped create marine reserves equivalent to half the size of Canada. I spoke to him about his mission and why it's so urgent. The state of the world's oceans is really bad. We have lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean. Sharks, groupers, cod, tuna. More than half of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. More than half of the ocean is affected by industrial fishing and global warming is killing coral reefs all around the world. The ocean is in a trajectory of decline. Can you just visualize for our viewers who never get to see the kind of things you are able to see, what an ocean and healthy ecosystem looks like versus one that's next to a bustling economic and industrialized area? Coral reefs in the United States, in the Florida Keys, are down to only 2% of what they used to be. Before, 80 to 90% of the bottom on a coral reef in the Caribbean was covered by live coral. Now, Florida Keys have only 2%. The average in the Caribbean is about 5% of the bottom covered by live coral. The rest is covered by slime and seaweed. And most of the fish you can see are this big. And it is very, very rare that if you jump into any place in the Caribbean at random, you see a shark. It's very, very rare. Now, let's go to Millennium Atoll, for example. An atoll that is uninhabited and fished south of the equator in the Central Pacific belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. 2009, we conducted the first, the first underwater expedition to this island, and I still remember the first time. Jumped over the side of the boat, and as soon as the bubbles cleared, I was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple minutes, the shark decided that we were boring, and they went back to do the thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral, and it's full of fish, and a sea turtle comes by. Now, this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. It is governments that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean. But also, local communities have an important role to play because some of the most successful protected areas in the ocean are community-led and community-managed marine reserves. So when the fish come back, the divers come in. 
and that creates huge economic opportunities through ecotourism. These areas that are managed by communities are very successful because the communities have a vested interest in having as many fish as possible inside them so they can enjoy the benefits. What from the pandemic has changed your view when it comes to protection of the environment? Nature has given us a very strong signal of how fast it can recover if we just give it space. Everybody was fascinated by all these videos of the whales and the dolphins coming into marinas and mountain lions on the streets of Santiago in Chile, wild goats in the UK. Nature has this extraordinary ability to bounce back if we just give it space. This is why we need to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. How do healthy marine ecosystems help in the fight against climate change though? Most people see the ocean as a victim of climate change, but the ocean can also be a solution because we know that the more life that is in the ocean, like big fish and big whales, the more these organisms help to make the ocean productive and absorb more CO2. The kelp forest, seagrass beds, all of these are important ecosystems in the ocean that are similar to the forests on the land that capture a lot of our carbon pollution. What are you most excited about in your field? We have 10 years to fix this problem. Global fisheries catch is going down, stocks are collapsing. Business as usual means that by 2050, 90% of the coral reefs are gone, that most commercial fisheries have collapsed. That affects food security, that affects a migration of people. We have 10 years to get to peak greenhouse gas emissions and then go carbon neutral by 2050. And we have 10 years to protect at least 30% of the ocean so we can restore much of this health and productivity not just for saving biodiversity, but also saving our life support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest mega city are located at the coast, and this number will double in, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for for human being. Coming up, from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. But how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green.
From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your Green in Brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. One of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is, uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system so that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now uh, China is taking similar steps so at the moment regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government and finally we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2015. Now we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is gonna need to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? 
So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year, the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. In London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. Marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from each beyond we cannot really go back. In the coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement based concrete, e concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna of plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We're geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide so it's always moist and therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars etc. 
these pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life. See the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, Econcrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed. To create niches for endangered species, or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral, an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. E-concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in the case of a coral, it will die and then another coral will sit on it and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete though is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, E-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage to the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green.